meal ready to eat. Ugh. The thing about an MRE is you got to get the right one. Anything that had the words formed patty, I always stayed away from those. <laughs> but if you got a jalapeno cheese spread, your day was made. Welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. My name is Claire Shorenstein, and I'm a registered dietitian and running coach based in New York City. Today's athlete nutrition profile features Jackie Sincata. She's not an elite athlete, she is a recreational one. However, her story is very inspiring and interesting. And so I asked her to come on the show to talk all about her experiences with sport and nutrition, and mostly as well her battle with rheumatoid arthritis, which she was diagnosed with at the age of three. Just a little background on Jackie. We actually worked together. Um, she was a nutrition client of mine on general healthy eating and sports nutrition for endurance running and cycling over the summer and fall of 2018. She's 34 years old. She lives in Arlington, Virginia. She was in the military and was deployed and recently finished grad school and now works in the public sector supporting global health. She has a really interesting story that I think you'll enjoy, um, including lots of ups and downs, times of being in remission, times of really struggling with her disease. Thankfully, now she's been in remission for about two years. She lost a ton of weight. She's extremely active. She's feeling good. She's trained for the Marine Corps Marathon, which is happening in late October. And I think you'll really enjoy hearing all about Jackie. If you're enjoying these podcast episodes, I'd really still appreciate your support. If you can head on over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and leave me a review or rating, that would be much appreciated. All right, everybody, enjoy this interview with Jackie Sincata. Hey, Jackie, how are you doing today? I, I'm doing great. Thank you for inviting me today. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Awesome. So let's just dive right in and chat about your rheumatoid arthritis. You were diagnosed at a young age, right? I was. My RA is a little bit different. I have something called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, mm -hmm. which is slightly different than adult onset rheumatoid arthritis. I was diagnosed at the age of three back in 1988. My mom was looking at some pictures and the, the story goes, it's a picture of my sister and I in our sailboat seersucker dresses. So we were like three and two. She was two. Mm -hmm. And she noticed that my knee didn't look right. It was swollen and I was in, in this really odd position. And we had just come back from my grandparents. My grandparents had a, a lake house, a log cabin on a lake and up in Jersey. And uh, we used to spend a lot of time there when we were little kids in the summer. So she thought maybe I fell because it's a lot of nature and it's an old log cabin. So she thought maybe I fell and I hurt my knee. And my grandmother was like, no, she didn't fall. So they started to take me to the doctor and they were trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Mm -hmm. I remember sitting on my dad's lap, getting blood drawn constantly. Mm -hmm. Originally, they thought I had leukemia. Oh, wow. Yeah, they thought I had leukemia. And that came back negative. And it was finally diagnosed that I have this illness called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Mine's a genetic. And they think what caused it to actually come about was I had a fever and a growth spurt at the same time. Hmm. And they think that actually caused it to, to, to present. Oh, wow. How common is, is this illness? It's not terribly common. Um, so the Arthritis Foundation does have a big awareness campaign regarding juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. They now call it juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Mm -hmm. Idiopathic meaning unknown cause. So they, the terminology has been kind of going back and forth now in the last few years between JRA and JIA. But I believe the last statistic I saw from the Arthritis Foundation is like one in every 300,000 kids is diagnosed with, with JRA. Okay. And what it is, is, you know, your body is attacking itself. Your immune system is hyperimmune and it attacks my joints and destroys them for an unknown, an unknown reason. Yeah. It actually went after my eyes and I used to have to get these drops, steroid drops put in my eyes because they thought I was going to go blind. That's a tough childhood, man. Like talk a little bit about, I mean, here you are now, of course, you're 34, you're extremely active, you're feeling good. It's been in remission for over two years. 
but obviously it took a lot of struggle to get there and it wasn't always that way. So, you know, talk to us a little bit about growing up with this illness and what were you on meds? Like what kinds of, like what did nutrition yeah. look like? Cause I know we are talking about nutrition here, uh, <laughs> physical activity. Were you able to be physically active? Like what, what did that all look like? So I have the best parents in the world and they did everything humanly possible. Ooh. <laughs> I'm emotional about this stuff. No, it's a tough topic. Yeah. They did everything humanly possible to make sure that I got the best care and that I could have as normal of a life as possible. Yeah. So growing up, one thing my dad was telling me was we, my sister and I used to have these little matching wooden rocking chairs. Mm-hmm. They used to sit in the family room, you know, watch TV and such. And I couldn't get out of the chair. So my dad or my mom would have to give me an aspirin just to get me out of the chair. Mm-hmm. And I have some, I had it called pararticular juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, which means it affected four or less joints at one time. Mm-hmm. But my JRA has basically affected pretty much all of my joints, except my backs and my, my back and my hips. I looked out there some, somehow. So medication wise, not a lot was known in the late 80s about JRA. So my first medication regimen at three years old started with 1350 milligrams of aspirin a day. And my mom was telling me, you know, what happens with aspirin? You know, you take that much aspirin as you bruise easily. Yeah. So she, one day she lifted me out of my car seat, you know, and it left a, a handprint. Oh my goodness. She had a signed notarized letter from, I was living, we were living in Long Island at the time. I was born out by St. James Smithtown, Long Island. So we were living out there at the time and she had a letter from police, the county, I forgot exactly what it was. And it was notarized basically saying that I was not a, you know, this is what I bruise because I'm on this medication regimen. Yeah. Later down the road, then they came out with Naperson. So what we now know is kind of like a leave or naproxen. Mm-hmm. I hated the Naperson. It tasted terrible. So my mom created this little Naperson cocktail is what we called it. And she would take the pill and dissolve it in water with a little bit of sugar. And then she would pour milk in it. And I had this little cup that had a baby big bird on it with a, <laughs> with a pink hood. And that's, that was my medicine cup. And that's how I took my, my medicine every day. Wow. So they didn't have a lot of medication options. And did this whole medication regime, like, I mean, were you eating normally at this time? Did this affect your appetite? I imagine, I mean, you were in pain, so that must have also affected the what you were able to eat, right? Yeah, my parents said I never complained about my joints hurting or everything, but there were foods I wasn't allowed to eat. I wasn't allowed to eat tomatoes. I wasn't allowed to eat potatoes. I wasn't allowed to eat eggplant and oranges, anything that had citric acid in it or anything that was a nightshade. Yeah. That was thought to make my RA worse. Okay. So like if I went to a part, you know, a, a friend's birthday party, well, what do you serve at birthday parties? Pizza. pizza. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, yeah. My mom used to bring peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Yeah. So that I could have something to eat at the at the party. But I, I stayed active. They try to keep things for me as normal as possible. So you were able to be active that didn't hurt too much. Exactly. So I, I was in physical therapy by the time I was three years old. And when we moved to New Jersey, the physical therapists and my doctors there thought one way that could help with my RA was to do dance. Hmm. So I was in first grade and we thought, and my mom signed my sister and I, up. so my sister's only about 15 months younger than me. So we're, we're practically the same age. Yeah. And so she signed us up for dance and to take tap. And I knew all my steps. I was never meant to be a dancer. It was just not my calling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, apparently I wasn't the most graceful. <laughs> the but did you have fun? Did you enjoyed it? I remember enjoying it, but even I remember like it really wasn't my thing. Sure. And it turned out that uh, I was better at hitting stuff. So that got me into Little League Baseball, Mm -hmm. which I played for years. I played baseball, softball for years. Um, I also played soccer as a kid. So even though I couldn't run, Mm -hmm. I could play goalie. The goalies didn't have to run. 
So then our town finally started a softball league. And my dad is a baseball coach. So he's like super, super into baseball. So he taught me how to play baseball. He taught me how to catch. He taught me how to throw. He taught me how to hit. We would spend hours at the batting cages. And that led me through middle school. I played in high school. And then in middle school and high school, I played field hockey. So you were super active. Yeah, I was I was an athletic kid. I didn't realize how active you were. I thought this was something you kind of got into later in life. No, I was I was always into sports. So the RA was well managed enough that you were able to do all this stuff. Yeah, I had some pretty bad bouts though mm-hmm. growing up. One was in fourth grade, mm-hmm. I got Lyme's disease. Lyme and RA don't really mix. Yeah. And that put me in a neck brace because I couldn't move my, I had a lot of problems with my neck. The next year I got Lyme again and Jersey, Jersey has a terrible, terrible Lyme problem. Except this time I remember waking up one morning, I was in fifth, fifth grade. I, I couldn't move my body from my head down. And I remember waking up screaming for my parents. Mm. Like, so at the time I, I couldn't understand what it felt like to be like paralyzed, but that's what it felt like. Cause I couldn't move. And what happened was the line mixed with my RA and it was like breaking up and it caused me really, really severe pain to the point that I, I couldn't, I couldn't move. That put me in a wheelchair for a little while. And how long did it take like to recover from those episodes? That took a few weeks. I had a really, really bad flare in college that almost prevented me losing my army ROTC scholarship. Oh, wow. And I wanted to commission more than anything. So once I was finally cleared to exercise again, I was in the gym at least four hours a day just so I could get myself back to the fitness level I was so I can pass my physical fitness test. And I did, and I got my commission. You know, before we dive into the military part, any kind of memories about your nutrition? I mean, especially if you're working out for four hours a day, you obviously yeah. need to be eating a little bit more to support that. Yeah. Anything stand out in your memory of how you ate or, you know, if you if there was a connection between managing your illness and mm-hmm. and choosing the foods that you ate? Were you making that connection at the time? I don't think I was making the connection at the time. I know my parents were. We always ate good fresh food. My dad is a phenomenal cook. He makes the best flank steak you've you've ever had. My mom makes these amazing soups and she makes them all from scratch and she makes these really amazing like chicken recipes. So my dad's side is is very Italian. My whole family originally comes from Brooklyn. So I grew up with a very Italian kind of Sicilian heritage. So we have the seven fishes meal for Christmas Eve. I grew up with foods like caponata and rice balls and everything that my grandmother makes is always made from scratch and fresh. Mm-hmm. And that's how we grew up. You know, my, my parents didn't keep a lot of junk food in the house. Dinner was usually, it was always, you know, like a good protein and, and vegetables. And it was embarking on, I think, good nutrition from, from that standpoint. What about college? So college was when the Atkins craze was huge, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, everyone was low carb. And so I kind of followed that craze a little bit because I thought, you know, if I want to keep lean for the army, I should stay low carb. When I actually look back on how I ate, I did not eat low carb, but I, <laughs> ate, a lot of whole, I ate a lot of whole foods. So for lunch every day, my college had a phenomenal salad bar. And every day I used to make a big spinach salad with like kidney beans and chickpeas and grilled chicken and veggies. And instead of dressing, I used a little bit of olive oil and I squeezed a lemon on it. That's how I ate. Awesome. You know, I was able to stay trim and and fit in in college in addition to being in the gym about three hours a day. (laughs) Yeah. And, And at what point did you join the military? So I joined through the Army ROTC program. Mm hmm. So I did ROTC all through all through college. I had to go through this whole waiver process for my JRA. So RA, JRA is what they call a medical disqualifying condition to get into the military. Um, so I had to prove that I was healthy enough and that I was in remission and that I was 100% capable of being able to do all the physical requirements through ROTC and to ultimately commission. Mm-hmm. 
And I was able to do that. The one thing I couldn't do 100% is so my left arm does not extend all the way. My left elbow is all messed up. So the bones in my left elbow, this happened in fifth grade, all the, it has all this bone spurring. Mm-hmm. And the bone spurring grew into each other and fused my elbow. Oh, wow. So I cannot extend my, my left elbow. So one thing you have to do in the army is you have to do a push-up. You have to have your back completely parallel to the ground, and then you have to fully extend your arms. Well, I couldn't fully extend my arms. But because I could go all the way down to the requirement, they said that was okay. And was joining the army, was that something you knew you wanted to do for a long time? Or or where did that motivation come from? That motivation came from, so I went to college in 2003, events that unfolded. I would just say events that unfolded a few years prior to 2003 in New York and affected in New Jersey. That was one reason. The two other reasons I realized was... I wanted to take care of soldiers. So originally I was going to go in into like occupational therapy and I had this plan of, you know, taking care of, of soldiers that mm-hmm. way. And then when I get out of the army, I wanted to take care of kids. That was my original plan. Mm-hmm. And then the third reason was to serve in my grandfather's honor, who was a uh, World War II veteran, as well as my other grandfather, my dad's father who served in the National Guard. So I wanted to serve for them. And my grandfather passed away right before I deployed. My grandmother also passed away right before I deployed. Oh, wow. But I was able to say like goodbye to my grandfather in uniform. So I felt like he was, you know, with he's been with me throughout my entire journey from the time I was in uniform, from the time I got home and, you know, transitioning now to being a civilian for the Department of Defense. So it, it just felt like he's always been with me. So those are the three reasons I I joined. I learned, however, I shouldn't be sticking people with needles. That's not a good idea. (laughs) I I, I can actually start an IV. I have been taught to start an IV, but I was better at the administration, you know, at the process, background, the the health admin side. So I, I stuck with that and been doing that as well as the global health work I do now. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, more about your military experience. Obviously, being in the military can be extremely physically demanding. So yeah, talk to us a little bit about that aspect of things. Yeah, I remember I was at Fort Knox in 2005 for a course. And one thing I had to do was we had a swim. They called it Oh, what do they call? They called it like Chew Tobacco Lake or whatever. It was it looked awful. I didn't want to swim in it, but it just it was brown. You couldn't see into the lake. But what we had to do was we had to swim half mile down, half mile back. But we had to do it in our gear, and we had to take our rucksack. So a rucksack, I had an extra large rucksack, which is huge. And you had to take our rucksacks and our rubber ducks, which are mock plastic weapons for the training and you had to tie them into your poncho and you had to put them on your back and you had to swim with all this stuff down and back. And I remember my uh, battle buddy could not swim and she was scared to death. And I said, okay, just hold on to my feet and kick. Oh, God. <laughs> and I had her stuff too. Right. So I, I ended up having her stuff, my stuff and her on my legs and she was just she was just so scared. I was like, okay, just just hold on. So she kind of became dead weight in addition to all the weight um, I was carrying on my back <laughs> trying to swim in this lake. And I was the second one who finished. I don't know how that happened. That was a feat of endurance. Yeah. Like had, oh my goodness. How long did that even take you? I don't even remember. I just remember swimming. Wow. They let you join the army when you can't swim? Um yeah, yeah they'll, they'll teach you. There, there's, okay. there, there's something called a combat in the army. It's a combat water survival test. That was actually one of the events, events I was really good at. Like I wasn't what they call a PT stud. I, I passed my PT test and um, I always felt like I had trouble with my PT test because I always had trouble with the run and the push-ups. But sit-ups, I used to knock out like 75 sit-ups in two minutes. Wow. Because that doesn't, that doesn't really do anything to your joints. Yeah. And I think that's what the same thing with swimming and the, and the CWST. So the one thing on the CWST is like they put you on a three-meter board and they blindfold you. 
and they give you a rubber duck and you have to jump into the pool and you have to keep a hold of the rubber duck. That's interesting. <laughs> so what did the what did the food component look like throughout all of this? MREs, meal ready to eat. Ugh. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> the thing about an MRE is you got to get the right one. So have, have you ever seen an MRE or what's in an MRE or how many calories are in an MRE? I have not seen one of them, no. Okay, so they come in these brown sealed bags, waterproof like sealed bags, and you need like a scissor or a knife or something to open them. And when you open it, you have food in vacuum sealed pouches. You get one spoon and it comes with, you might get like a beef ravioli or you might get a, Anything that had the words formed patty, I always stayed away from those. <laughs> oh, God. I liked the beef stew because the beef stew used to come with a brownie or what, what looked like a brownie. And then you would get like a crackers and like a spread. The winner is like if you get – so you can get a cheese spread or you can get a peanut butter. But if you got a jalapeno cheese spread – your day was made. That was like one of the best things you can get is jalapeno cheese spread. That sounds so disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the good stuff. But the thing is you have to knead it because it separates in the package. Oh, God. And you have to knead it and then you open it. And then the other thing that could only be better than the jalapeno cheese spread is if you got a chocolate peanut butter. So that sounds good. Yeah. That one so I, could, I could deal with. So I was in the field one day. So you either get like a cheese spread or a peanut butter. And I don't know if somebody at the MRE factory was like feeling really nice or just messed up. And I opened up my MRE and I had both a jalapeno cheese spread and a chocolate peanut butter. Oh, nice. I was so excited. I took a picture. <laughs> I was like, this is the best MRE I've ever had in my life. <laughs> um, they also come with a heater. So you pour water into this heater and it lets off a gas and you put the the packet, like your your main meal into it to, to heat it up. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. So like some of them are really good. The pasta ones were usually were usually pretty good. The beef stew one was good. Veggie omelet. Oh no. <laughs> now, chili Mac is a, is big doings. You know, you got a Chili Mac MRE, you have a good day. And how many calories were these things? They have about, I think I, I want to say like 5,000 calories each. And did you always finish them? I never always finished them. They're designed to like when you're like in gear and you're, ex and you're expending thousands of calories. But if you're not doing that, you know, they're very highly caloric. So you have to, you know, you got to be careful seriously, like how much you eat if you're not, you know, if you're not burning that off. Yeah. I used to eat like the main meal and usually like one of the, one of the spreads. Sometimes you would get like Skittles. That was cool. You got Skittles. Nothing will ever beat the jalapeno cheese spread, chocolate peanut butter in the same package. That was just the best day of my life. They would give these out to just everyone indiscriminately, or I'm surprised they didn't have different MREs for different purposes. You know, like, mm -hmm. like if you're in a role that isn't as active, which I imagine there must be, I mean, I'm not, mm -hmm. I really don't know that much about the military, but mm -hmm. you know, versus like being out in combat, burning in all your gear, as you said, like you really need those 5,000 calories. Yeah. Um, Cause that seems wasteful if you're like just handing out the same thing to everybody and you don't necessarily need it. There's usually a box of like what people throw, you know, the stuff they didn't eat into a big box of stuff. So you can go and kind of graze and you can store them for years. And like if a zombie apocalypse ever happened and you have MREs <laughs> in the basement, you're, you're going to be good to go because I don't know if they actually go bad. <laughs> That's sure, so scary. I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. Did you ever get care packages from your family? I did get care packages from my family. So one thing I really just missed on my deployment was liquid coffee creamer. I just want, like, you you, you miss the weirdest stuff. Yeah, I was going to say, that's a very random thing to miss. It was a very random thing, but you miss the weirdest stuff. In my deployment, I was a staff officer in my deployment. So I was in a, I was in a building that was made out of plywood and worked like at a, at a computer so we had, had coffee 
and my shift started at 5 a.m 5 a.m to like eight o'clock at night mm-hmm. so that was what i was usually working so i would always make the pot of first pot of coffee of the, of the of the day for my team and uh i was so tired i used to just literally fill the coffee all the way to the top of the filter and then brew it it was like drinking mud it was awful <laughs> But it was, it woke me up. But we only had powdered coffee creamer. And all I wanted was just some liquid coffee creamer. I wrote to my aunt and I said, I don't know if there's any way that you could send me liquid coffee creamer. And I get a care package from my aunt, my grandparents, my my dad's parents. And she sent me two boxes of those coffee mate. Well, the ones you don't have to refrigerate by the gross. Oh my God. That must have cost a fortune to send halfway around the world. (laughs) Well, when you send care packages overseas, there's actually different organizations you can send them to. to Oh, got it. Okay. And then on top of that, it's hard to get chocolate over in Iraq because it's so hot. So my grandfather added a five pound box of (laughs) M&Ms. So I had... 288 packets of liquid coffee creamer and this giant five pound box of, of chocolate m and I hope you shared. Oh, I, of, course, <laughs> of course I did. And he threw a daily news newspaper on the top of it because, you know, he figured I'd miss a newspaper and he was right. It was nice to kind of catch up on what was, what was going on in, in New York. Yeah. My NCO's mother used to send this. She sent the best care packages. She used to send <laughs> Uh, these pretzels, these amazing like seasoned flavored pretzels. And we used to share those and this licorice that she got from like a a candy maker, lots of Girl Scout cookies. We used to use them for barter. So if you wanted like information from us and I had tagalongs, like peanut butter tagalongs, and you wanted them because you didn't have them, then you need to give me the information for me to give you the (laughs) tagalongs. And so so your role when you were deployed wasn't a particularly active one, it sounds like. No, I wasn't particularly active. I was a medical operations, what they call medical operations and plans officer. And then I also oversaw a lot of the patient movement that went on in my unit. So I had a track where all my guys and girls, you know, where all the soldiers in my unit were going, Mm -hmm. what caches they were at, what status they were, if they were going back to the States, if they were returned to duty. Mm -hmm. And when you have a 4,200 person brigade, that's, that's a lot to track. And then I was in also working kind of like medical current operations as well. So I was doing a number of roles. So I was, I was opera, I was an operational staff officer. And how long were you out there for? I was there from January 2009 to beginning of September in country. And then my deployment orders were for over a year. So I was mobilized in 2008 and we did all this train up at a a number of different army bases. And then when I came home, I was in charge of tracking any of our soldiers that were going into what they call a warrior transition unit, medical warrior transition unit, helping get their orders for them to do so. So kind of the the guys that were put on what they call medical hold and, and making sure that they got where they needed to go before I was released from my orders. So you were back in the States when? I was back in the States beginning of September, I think. So long ago. It was 10 years ago. I remember just from us working together, you said you started feeling unwell again with regards to the RA in 2011. And that's when you gained a lot of weight. You were on meds, like Mm -hmm. talked a little bit about that whole path and how you overcame that. When I came home, I I actually lived in in New York and I took took a job with the company in the city. That job required me to basically be in a car. I was in a car all day working between all five boroughs and lower Westchester County. It was a great job. I mean, I, I was in, I was in charge of a lot of stuff at a, at a young age. So I thought, you know, just from the grind of the, what I was doing, um, I was just getting tired. But I started to gain weight. I started to feel like fatigue, like really bad fatigue. My joints were starting to bother me. And those are kind of signs for me that something isn't right. And you hadn't experienced any of this while you were deployed, right? No, I didn't experience anything while I was deployed. Hmm. When, I, when I came home and I went to the doctor because I figured something, I, I thought maybe I was flaring. 
And I went to a few doctors in the city. And I just kept getting told I was tired and stressed out. So I used to go do indoor cycling in the city. I used to go, I had a a bike, a hybrid bike at the time. So I would ride around on my hybrid bike. I went to personal trainers. I was trying to figure out like a diet. You know, at the time I was like, I was even crash dieting because I couldn't understand why I was gaining so much weight. Mm -hmm. And it got to a point where um, I was sleeping anywhere from 18 to 20 hours on the weekend because I was exhausted. You never saw me without like a venti cup of coffee in my hand. But I just kept getting told that I was fine because at one point they actually said, well, yeah, you know, this is this is slightly above normal and this and this, but it's most likely a false positive because you already have JRA. Like, okay. So I, I dealt with it. So then I actually got a new job down here in the DC area with a, with a big four consulting firm. And I moved down here. And I thought maybe just getting out of the city because, you know, you're, you're in New York. It's not, yep. it's not a cool <laughs> city to live in. I mean, I love, I love New York. I always, always love New York. But I thought maybe if I got out of the city and I came down to D.C., which is much more open, there's a lot of green space. Yeah. It's a very fit-minded area. You can easily travel by bike without even having to get on a main road around here. So I thought maybe just a change of pace and a change of scenery would help. Loved my job. I was doing well with my job. I was still gaining weight. And finally in 2015, I was sitting at my desk at work and I could not stand up from my desk. I was in so much pain. I actually started crying at my desk. I couldn't move. Hmm. Finally found a doctor who seemed to know what she was doing. And I walked in and before she even started to examine me, she's like, you are completely flared up. And I went through my history with her. She said what I did was because I kept getting told I was fine. I developed this very, very high tolerance, like a threshold of pain tolerance to the point that it just peaked. Yeah. And when that happened, I couldn't walk. Wow. And so, yeah, where did things go from there? So I got put on a lot of medication. I remember when it was really bad, I I literally could not walk from my couch to like my my kitchen in my condo. I remember one time I, I dropped my brush. I was brushing my hair in the bathroom and I dropped my brush. I couldn't even bend down to pick up my brush. And I just, I lost it. Like that was it. Like that was, that was the official thing that had just happened. I just completely lost it. Yeah. I think a lot of people take being able to walk for granted. Oh, absolutely. It's something that you can do. Yeah. But when you can't do it, and all you want to be able to do is to be able to do it, it is a horrible feeling. And you're trying to understand why your body is doing this to itself when you've always tried to take care of yourself, when you've always tried to do the right things. So from from that point, I got put on a lot of medication. I got put on methotrexate, which is a, a low dose form of chemotherapy put me on Voltaren, Mobic, a high dosage of prednisone to, to get my, to just get some of the inflammation down. So what is prednisone? It's a steroid. What does steroid do? It makes you gain weight. It doesn't help <laughs> so, with the weight gain. Yep. Just as like this kind of this cocktail of medication. My doctor wanted to see this regimen, if it would help. Mm-hmm. Nine months went by and my doctor was just not happy with my levels. So she said I was going to have to go on an injectable biologic and that was the second turning point. And again, I got in my car in the parking lot and I, I did. I cried. Yeah. <laughs> I cried. I cried a lot during when I was sick and I called my mom. I remember asking and saying, I was like, why can't I get in remission now? I've been in remission before. So the longest bout I've been in remission was of over 10 years. I'm like, so why can't I get in remission now? What am I doing wrong? Hmm. So I started to research nutrition. So I was in grad school for, for public health. Which you just finished. Congrats. Thank you. Doing two back-to-back masters, I, I do not recommend doing that. <laughs> the whole time. Yeah. That was, that, was, that was exhausting. I was probably adding to the stress a little bit. Yeah, that sure that didn't help. <laughs> yeah. I started to kind of deep dive into nutrition to see what, what am I missing? I was researching like rheumatoid arthritis and nutrition, which there wasn't a whole lot on. So I looked at inflammation and nutrition. Mm-hmm. And I found a lot on inflammation and nutrition, particularly around processed food, particularly around sugar 
and grains and gluten. I was like, all right, well, let's let's see if that works. I mean, if, if those can be inflammatory foods, let me just try knocking them out of my diet. So I went cold turkey and cut it all out of my diet. And I went on this very kind of plant-based whole food approach. And when you say plant-based, are you saying like full vegan or just including more plant foods? I would say I was like 80% plant-based Okay. and then 20% animal protein. I also started to create little habits for myself. So one thing in public health I learned about was health behavior and learning about what are like your barriers? What are your actual barriers? What are your perceived barriers that are maybe preventing you from doing something or getting to where you want to go? So I actually took these theoretical models that are evidence-based and applied it to myself while trying to figure out how to get myself into remission. On top of figuring this out, because my levels were so high, I was not allowed to exercise. Hmm. Telling me I can't exercise is like telling me I can't have air to breathe. That's how I deal with stress. That's I feel you. <laughs> life. Yeah, so no exercise on top of dealing with all the stress. Yeah. So I, I started to apply all that to myself and my levels actually started to go down. And my doctor started to decrease my dosages. And then September 2016, she said I could start to exercise again. I was still on medication and I was still flare with my RA, but I could exercise again. Mm -hmm. So I do truly believe that looking at what I was eating in terms of nutrition and understanding that there are some foods out there that are inflammatory and because I had inflammation going on in my system with my RA helped. Yeah. But you also lost a lot of weight during this time as well, which also helps. Yep. I had a 50 pound weight gain from my RA. Fast forward to now though, I have lost now 70 pounds. Wow. That's a mix of, I don't want to say diet. I want to say lifestyle. People always ask me, well, what, what's your diet? I'm like, I don't have a diet. I just eat real food. Yeah. I just really focus on the quality of the food that I'm eating. And then the other question I get asked is like, well, what do you use to count your calories? And I said, I did not count one calorie on this weight loss journey because I was so focused on the quality of the food that I was eating. Yeah. So I would, if I went into the supermarket, I just go around and I stick to the outside. I don't even go to the inside unless it's to get like olive oil or, you know, some avocado oil or something. Yeah. I don't buy a lot of stuff in the middle of the aisles. I mean, there, there are some things inside that are, that are good quality, but yes, I get, I get your point. <laughs> and yeah. I think, I think when we started working together um, in 2018, you were 50, 60 pounds down or something. You were trying to yep. get like that last little bit off. That last 10. Yeah. It was yeah, like that last yeah. 10 or 15 off. And yeah, I was getting frustrated because that's when I had started to really get into running. So I was cycling and I was running and I was bonking because I was having a hard time getting carbs into my system because typical carbs like breads and pastas and, and all that, they can bother my joints. Like I can actually swell up. So the two things that tend to make me swell up now, even though I'm in remission, is the weather. I'll swell up and wrapped up on my couch like a burrito or certain foods. You know, it's frustrating because sometimes I can have a piece of bread and be fine and I can have a piece of bread from something else and I'll swell up. So I just tend to stay away from it. Yeah. I was having a hard time getting carbs into my system. So you and I worked on that. We did a sweat test. We also see, because I tend to leave lakes under my bike. <laughs> I remember when I sent you, remember yeah. when I sent you the picture of the- Oh yeah, the, I remember. Uh -huh. <laughs> under my bike. Yeah. It was almost, uh, it was over five pounds. <laughs> I lost a lot <laughs> of sweat. So we realized I was losing a lot of electrolytes and a lot of salt. Yeah. So you and I worked on that. Awesome. You know, I mean, it's, it's been a little while since we worked together, of course. And I know you were getting into running. Um, you, of course, do your Peloton. Um, you're mm -hmm. doing a bunch of outdoor cycling. You know, at what point did you get really more into these sports and, you know, what's going on with you right now? I would say what got me more into outdoor cycling was I've been setting small goals for myself to try to get to bigger goals. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big fan of training to a goal. What's the purpose of my training? What am I striving for? And the first goal I wanted to do was I wanted to complete my first century in 2017. It's a 100, 100 mile bike ride. Yeah. And that wasn't too long after I was finally declared to be in remission in March of 2017. So my goal was just to finish and I finished. 
And I felt like that ride, I, I really got the bug, you know, I, how much I just love riding outside. That has led to really focus more on my training and, you know, really trying to balance between cycling training and really now getting into running, which I was told my whole life I couldn't do, mm. you know, that I can't run because of my knees, and my ankles, which have some pretty uh, decent amount of damage in them. But I think it's different when you're told by people who probably don't know how to run, telling you that you can't run versus now being taught to run by those who know how to run. Sure. And being able to actually work in your own in your own fitness and what that means. So when I understood what that meant, you know, working in your own fitness, I took that concept by the horns and really focused on it. And that was also a big part of weight loss. And I just wanted to kind of see what else could I push myself to do. So a few weeks ago, I did another century. So my first century, I finished in about eight hours. Mm -hmm. It was super flat. I don't even think it was a thousand feet elevation. It was super flat. And it was about 11 mile per hour pace. And I finished a century it was like two or three weeks ago. I had 5,000 feet of climbing at a 15 mile per hour average pace. And I did most of it on my big ring. I climbed Bear Mountain twice this year, which awesome. was like the most epic thing imaginable. You know, I got the Jersey Grand Fondo this weekend. And then I got the Army 10 miler um, in October. And then the big event that I'm training for is the Marine Corps Marathon at the end of October, which I started by setting a small goal for myself to see if I can complete a half marathon. Mm -hmm. So I did the half marathon in May, the Marine Corps half, mm -hmm. and I, I did it. I was awesome. like, okay, well, if I, can, if I can do a half, I can do a whole, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's only an extra 13 <laughs> miles, right? That's, that's, that's not too bad. So I've been focusing on marathon training and cycling. The The running has, you know, taken more precedence, you know, kind sure. of for the marathon. All the last few weeks, I've been cycling a little bit more. That's a pretty um, packed schedule. I mean, Marine Corps is right around the corner. We're already in early September at the time of recording. Yes. So that's like really coming up. Yeah, it's the very last weekend in October. So I figure between the Jersey Grand Fondo this weekend, the Army 10 miler, and then the Marine Corps Marathon, and then after that, I will fall down. Yeah, <laughs> so, you deserve a break after that. Yeah, so I'm really, but I'm really excited about it. It's a really fun race. I did that, oh God, what year did I run it? 2014? 2015? I forget what year it was. Oh, I was living down here at the time. It definitely wasn't a great day for me. It was warm and I did do so wonderfully, but it was back when I was kind of still somewhat competitive with my road marathoning. And, and I remember just starting and it was like a mass start. Like there was no, there were no corrals, you know, there, it was yeah. just like a very different kind of race, but it was great. I really enjoyed it. And my husband and I were both running and I'm much faster than he is. I was like slowing <laughs> down. He was speeding up and so he was like slowly catching up to me. And our cousin was there and, mm -hmm. and he was just like messing with us. And so like I ran yeah. by and I was having a really horrible race and, you know, this was like, I don't know, maybe in the early twenties or something, it, you know, it was almost, it was getting to near the end and he's yeah. like, Eric's right behind you. And I'm like, Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> I was like really angry. I was like looking behind. I was like, he can't beat me. Um, <laughs> uh, but the, Oh my God, that finish though, is just brutal. It's like, it feels like a mountain, but then you finish and then, you know, the Marines there at the end, like giving yeah. you a medal and it's just like epic. Yeah. So you're, you're yeah. really going to enjoy it. I don't even care what time I finish. I don't care if I have to drag myself across the finish line with my face. I am going to finish this race. You'll do great. Yeah, It'll be awesome. Cool. So before we kind of move on, tell me a little bit about your sports nutrition, you know, cause it's been a while since we worked together and what's that looking like, especially given that you are mostly avoiding kind of processed sugars in mm -hmm. your everyday nutrition. But of course, it's a totally different story when it comes to sports nutrition. So what kind of products are you using these days? So my favorite gel are the honey stingers. Those are mm -hmm. the only ones I use. I, I tried other brands. The Goose gave me a horrible stomach ache. I haven't tried those. I haven't done those since. And the Gatorade ones also bothered my stomach. But the I really like the, the honey stingers because they're honey. Yeah, they're honey with a little bit of flavoring in it. And they still give you, you know, the boost that you need. But even even with the honey stingers, there's only even certain flavors of the honey stingers that I can tolerate when I'm active. I use so I use those. I really like the cliff blocks, especially the ones that have a little bit of extra salt in it. If it's if it's hot, or if I know I'm going to be doing a, a long workout, 
those give me some pretty good energy. The new Cliff chews or blocks, they're made with like dates with like some kind of nut butter in them. Oh, I haven't seen those. Cliff cubes. Those are really good. Those I, I like for cycling. So for running, I like kind of more liquidy stuff. So like a gel. For cycling, um, especially if I'm doing a long distance, I, I really like long distance cycling. I like doing like 75 to like 100 miles. Yes. Yeah. That's the, the kind of stuff I prefer to do. I find if I have something a little bit more solid, I like the honey stinger, gluten-free Stroop waffles. Mm -hmm. Those have been pretty good. And I like the Scratch Labs lemon and lime for my electrolyte because I find I need a lot of salt because I, I sweat a lot. So I do put additional salt into my water with that mix. Yeah. And there are products out there that have more salt and, and more calories for that matter than scratch. Yeah. So you can, you can continue to mess around with that if, if you're interested. Yeah. We can talk about offline. Yeah. Any real food on the bike? I like bananas if I'm riding because they're, they're quick, easy to eat, but it's hard to ride with a banana. Yeah, as I say, it's not something to carry. <laughs> that's that's kind of hard to, to hard to ride with a banana. Like if I'm doing an event, they always tend to have bananas, which I like. I love pickle juice. Oh my God, I love pickle juice. <laughs> I, I buy big, giant things of pickles solely for the pickle juice so I can, I can drink it. I also drink a lot of raw apple cider vinegar. Why? I have found fermented foods, um, so like sauerkraut, raw apple cider vinegar, kimchi. Mm -hmm. I, eat a lot of, I eat a lot of kimchi. Uh, <laughs> kimchi. <laughs> kimchi. They tend to make me feel better. Okay. I'm just in general. And kimchi also can be a little salty. So that's a, sure. that, that's, that's been helpful. But with the apple cider vinegar, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but has shown to be anti-inflammatory. So what I see though people do is they drink it straight. Uh -huh. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. But I have actually found it helps me prevent to get cramps in my legs. Because it's a vinegar, you know, it's like a pickle juice. Sure. But you take like maybe a shot's worth and you dilute it with like 32 ounces of water, you know, and that's, that's how you drink it. And then I put just a, maybe a little, sometimes I'll put a little, little bit of honey and a little bit of cinnamon and, and, it, and I'll, I'll shake it up and I'll drink it in a big pitch in a kind of like a big giant, like one of those big Bubba Jug pitcher things. Mm -hmm. And it tastes like an apple pie. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like I mean, a very strange combination to be attributed a, to apple pie, but I'll take yeah, the word for it. It's, a, it's just it's a stretch of the imagination. But um, if you just like, I, really close your eyes and think really you hard, really, if you believe enough that it kind of tastes like apple pie. It kind of does taste like. That apple sounds pie. like that sounds like your MREs and trying to envision it. it's an actual omelet or something. Um, <laughs> like, very true. Anyway. I, I have about one of those a day. Okay. Hey, yeah, drink, you know, everyone. whatever whatever floats your boat and works for you. I mean, yeah, again, that's I, the whole point of this podcast is to yeah, share you know what? what you know what works for everybody or, or what I works know. for one person, I guess. Yeah, I don't get muscle cramps in my legs. All right. Awesome. Maybe you can email me your recipe and I'll post it in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, if you believe hard enough, it does actually taste decent if you put a little, little bit of honey in it. Got it. You also could just have a slice of apple pie, people. But you sure. You could have a slice of apple pie. That is, that is a very good point. So we'll wrap things up with my quick bites questions. Okay. All right. So favorite meal or snack when in a hurry? Oh, I love my blueberry smoothie that I make. One of my things, I always have uh, frozen fruit and frozen vegetables in my freezer. And I buy blueberries in like these three pound bags. And I try to buy the wild ones if I can, because I have a higher antioxidant count in them. Um, and I mix that with a little bit of almond milk and cinnamon. And I just mix that up and I drink that and I bring that with me. Sometimes I'll put some pro uh, like a plant-based protein in there. And that always wakes me up in the morning in addition with, uh, with my coffee. Okay. And favorite meal or snack when you're not in a hurry? Oh, man, that's a tough one. It would have to be a tie between my grandmother's scongeli, which is amazing. So you know the shell that you pick up at the beach that you listen that you listen to to hear the ocean? Yeah. Conch or conch. Uh -huh. Meat that's inside that. So in our family, it's called scongeli. And really, Fra Diablo is uh, basically the meat of that in a spicy red sauce. And 
It's a battle between my grandmother and my dad, though. You know who makes <laughs> who makes the better scongeli. The only thing that is a is a greater competition is who makes better meatballs. It's my dad or my or my grandmother. But I would have to say scongeli is probably my one of my favorite dishes ever. Got it. Biggest cook- cooking catastrophe. Oh, there's so many. When I was living in New York, we had a, a potluck for the holidays and. I thought I would try to make something, you know, try to, instead of just stopping at Whole Foods and getting food, like I would make something. Mm -hmm. So I thought I would make cookies. So I found this like chocolate chip cookie recipe that had like peanut butter in the inside. So like they were like chunky, but they were supposed to be filled with like a peanut butter. I I don't know what I did. I don't know if I read the recipe wrong. But the peanut butter from inside the cookies exploded. Oh no! From the cookies in the in the oven. Oh gosh! And they started to smolder. Then <laughs> I had smoke coming out of my oven into my kitchen. The fire alarms went off. That was that was that was great. You might you might have won so far for a biggest cooking catastrophe <laughs> for that answer. <laughs> Needless to say, I stopped at Whole Foods and I brought something for the potluck. Yeah, it sounds like the good a good decision. <laughs> How do you like your eggs cooked? I like them fried. Nice. I forget if you drink or not. If you do, what's your favorite uh, favorite drink? Let's see, so if it's a beer, there's two I like: Stella Artois or a Blue Moon on draft, really cold with two slices of orange mm-hmm. for wine. I like a really, really dry Riesling or red Chianti. Mm-hmm. And then for a liquor, I, I drink very, very seldom. But if I have, get a mixed drink, I like mojitos. Okay. And last question, top three items of gear that are most essential to your active lifestyle? My power meter. If I don't have a power meter, I'm lost. I'm confused. I have no idea what's going on. I have to have my power meter. Um, my Garmin watch is is definitely essential and i would say the third one i would say it's a tie between my oakley sunglasses and my yankees visor so if i'm out running i will always have on my yankees visor and if i'm running and i'm riding i will always have my oakley prism roads on so i would say those are the top three things that i i must have awesome well thanks so much for your time tonight jackie and sharing your story you know, you filled in a lot of the details that I didn't or, you know, already know about, especially regarding your deployment and everything. So thanks so much for sharing that. I know it's not an, always an easy story to share. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for inviting me on. I, mean, I was truly honored when you asked me. So thank you. Yeah, definitely. And where can people find you on social media if they're interested in uh, getting in touch? You can find me on Facebook or you can find me on Instagram. So on Instagram, I am I'm Le Chic Jacqueline. So it's L-E underscore C-H-I-C underscore Shaqueline, J-A-C-Q-U-E-L-I-N-E. If we have any Peloton folks listening, do you want to share your leaderboard name or do you want to keep that a secret? <laughs> no. So if I'm Le Chic Shaqueline on Instagram, I am Le Chic JQ on, on Peloton. Okay. So L-E underscore C-H-I-C underscore J-Q. All right. Thanks, Jackie. Have a great night. Thanks, you too. And that wraps up my interview with Jackie Sincata. We, of course, worked together a while ago, so I already knew some of her story, but I still learned a lot, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. This episode actually was the last in season one of my podcast, so I hope you've enjoyed season one. And of course, if you've missed any episodes, check them out. They're on my website, Eat for Endurance. Um, Go to the podcast page. You can, of course, also go to iTunes or wherever else you get your podcasts for the full listing. I hope to be back in action in January 2020 with some new episodes for you. And I actually already recorded one of them, which is proving to be quite challenging with a two-month-old, but getting it done. Happy holidays, everybody, and looking forward to seeing you all in the new year.